So I think uh, I think we are going to start. So uh, a really huge and, and warm welcome to Lisa Robertson uh, uh, tonight. Uh, this is our final uh, Center for Poetry and Poetics uh, uh, event within the what we call this year safe reading series. Safe because most of our readings were uh, were uh, uh, transferred online because of the pandemic. So thank you, thank you, Lisa, for 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 accepting this very last minute invitation and uh, I can't quite express how 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 lucky we are uh, to have you. Lisa Robertson um, has read in Sheffield for Sheffield and for the for the center uh, before a few years ago I think with uh, uh, within a conversation with Zoe Scalding as, as far as I can remember but it, it's out with before my time I also know that Lisa read in Sheffield um, uh, in 2005, the fictional version, the fictional version of that, I think you can read in, uh, in, in what <laughs> <laughs> I've already told people. So because I picked up on that, I thought it was a reading that I was at, but oh gosh, no. we said in an email it, it was well before uh, my time in Sheffield. Um, um, so before I introduce Lisa, this is uh, going to be an hour-long event. A, a, a really warm welcome to, to, to you all and thank you for coming. Um, uh, after me uh, briefly introducing Lisa, which is not really necessary, but I will still uh, stick to the formal um, uh, program, uh, Lisa will be reading from the novel uh, uh, for about 20 minutes, uh, which will be followed uh, by uh, a short, rather short Q&A with me and Adam. And if there is time, we'll, we'll open the questions uh, up to you uh, guys as well, to the audience. And then without the break, we'll move into the next uh, uh, part of the reading, which will be from Lisa's new work, again, followed by a short uh, uh, Q&A and We'll then uh, uh, say our fair thank yous and farewells before we really, really break up for the uh, uh, for the summer and and close this academic year and the and the series. So uh, I'm really, really pleased to 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 welcome yet again uh, Lisa Robertson here in the sort of virtual Sheffield environment. Uh, who is a Canadian poet who works at the intersection of essay and verse, research and invention, the terrestrial and the utopian, the plastic arts and literature. Her books of poetry, not necessarily in chronological order, are three summers. Uh, I think, potentially, I think if I'm correct, is the latest <clears throat> that came out in 2016 by Coach House. Then Cinema of the Present was also a Coach House publication in 2014. Weather, The Weather by New Star, a 2002 publication. Uh, I think we all know that weather was written during uh, uh, Lisa's uh, Cambridge uh, year, if I'm, if, if I'm correct there. Then Man, The Man by, in 2006. Lisa Robertson's Magenta So Whip, uh, 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 again, Coach House, uh, uh, published in 2005. Then there are two really, really um, cool books, I think, uh, uh, sort of prose essays or, or a sequence of, of, of prose essays. One of them is Milling. Uh, this was a 2012 publication and, and occasional work and seven walks from the office for soft architecture. Uh, uh, was published in or were published as essays uh, in 2011 again by Coach House uh, and uh, originally in 2003 by Clear Cut. Uh, the latest publication is 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 the novel we'll soon uh, hear Lisa reading from. Uh, that was a 2020 publication uh, by Coach House Toronto, the Baudelaire Fractal, <clears throat> and. It is, a, it is a, a book which was also shortlisted for the Governor General's Award for Literature in, in Canada 2020. <clears throat> Lisa uh, Robert, Robertson were, uh, lectures, performs and teaches across Europe, um, in Canada and in the USA. And 
lives in a small village currently um, in France, in the Nobel Aquitaine uh, region of France for the past uh, very many years now, uh, as we heard uh, before we started the recording. So over to you and to the, to the audience as well. Thanks very much, Aggie. How is this sounding? Is, uh, is that at an a adequate volume and all of that? Okay. Um, I'm going to read the first opening short chapter from the Baudelaire Fractal, and then a, uh, a, a slightly truncated um, version of the second chapter, The Port. Um, each of these chapters has um, a brief title, and all of those titles were borrowed from Baudelaire's prose poems in Paris Spleen. Um, but they were, the chapters weren't written to the titles. I sort of did a, a rough cut and paste and added titles that loosely seemed appropriate to the chapters after I'd written them all, because um, it seemed like a um, fun idea. Um, so this one is foreign. Raised from babydom into doubt, I'm as feminine as Rousseau. I, Hazel Brown, eldest daughter of a disappearing class, penniless neophyte stunned by the glamour of literature, tradeless, clueless, yet with considerable moral stamina and luck, left my family at 17 to seek a way to live. It was the month of June in 1979. I was looking for beauty. I didn't exactly care about art. I simply wanted not to be bored and to experience grace. So I thought I would write. No other future seemed preferable. Let me be clear. I did not want to admire life. I did not want to skim it. I wanted to swim in it. I judged that to do this, I had to leave and to write. I wanted to speak the beautiful language of my time, but without paying. I myself was not beautiful, moody, angular, both dark and pale, a bad posture for I was perpetually thrust forward as if rushing into time, awkward whilst being observed, a half broken tooth in my reluctant smile uncertain in manners, premature frown lines between my gray-green eyes, all of this magnified by an urgency with no recognizable context, comedic in short, in the mode of a physical comedy. Prodigal, undisciplined, with an aptitude for melancholy, I left houses, cities, lovers, schools, hotels, and countries. I left with haste or I left languidly. Also, I was asked to leave. I left languages and jobs. Leaving made a velocity. I left garments, books, notebooks, and several good companions. Sometimes I left ideas. After the leaving, then what? I suppose I would drift. I had no money and no particular plan. Cities exist, hotels exist, paintings exist. Tailoring also it exists as anger exists, mascara and melancholy and coffee. I liked sentences and I liked thread. Reading surely and excessively exists also convivially perfume and punctuation. I had a fantasy and my diary. I had my desire with its audacity, its elasticity and its amplitude. I carried a powder blue manual Smith Corona typewriter in a homemade tapestry bag. I was eager, sloppy, vague. I wore odd garments. I carried no letter of introduction and I knew no one. I was only a girl bookworm. I wasn't to stay. 
None of this troubled me much. The nervous fluid of a city is similar to a grammar or an electric current. Loving and loathing, we circulate. I myself did not exist before bathing in this medium. Here I become a style of enunciation, a strategic misunderstanding, a linguistic funnel, a wedge in language. Here I thought I'd destroy my origin, or I did destroy it by becoming the she dandy I found in the margins of used paperbacks. What do I love? I love the elsewhere of moving clouds. Reading unfolds like a game called I in public gardens in good weather, in a series of worn down hotel rooms, in museums in winter, where I is the composite figure who is going to write, but hasn't yet. If I am not alone in these rooms, if I could be no one, it would be by the skinny red haired street singer, the secretary of Cologne in her ironical cast off dress, the hard shod horse girls neighing in the dark apartment by similarly hybrid she strangers and foreigners, any girl with the combined rage of lassitude and complicity. They are blazons. Cool threads of anger bind me to them. We cease to be human. We're neutral, desituated clouds. There is nothing left to fear. This realization is a vocation. My name is Hazel Brown. The Port. I awake in a hotel room. I hear gulls, the clinking and rocking of boats. I turn in the wide bed. The tightness and stiffness of the sheets feels pleasantly confining. In the first stirrings of thinking, I discover within myself a strangeness, not a dislocation or a dissociation, but a freshening shimmer of sensual clarity shot through with strands of unmoored refusal and scorn. Beneath that, a slowly vibrating warp of erotic sadness. I abandon myself to this novel sensation. I open my eyes. Reader, I become him. Was that what I felt? No, I did not become him. I became what he wrote. Do you sometimes at earliest waking observe yourself struggling towards a pronoun? Do you fleetingly, as if from a great distance, strain to recall who it is that breathes and turns? Do you ever wish to quit the daily comedy of transforming into the I speaker without abandoning the wilderness of sensing? The sensation isn't morbid. It is ultimately disinterested. For me, it's a familiar moment, boring and persistent and disappointing. Again, one arrives at the threshold of this particular straightening eye. With a tiny wincing flourish, one enters the wearisome contract, sets foot to planks. Daily, the humiliation is almost forgotten until it blooms again with the next waking. It is an embarrassed perception, best stoically flicked aside, left unreported. With an obscure hesitation, one steps into the day and its frame and its costume. Between the puzzlement and its summary abandonment, between the folds of waking consciousness and their subsequent limitation is a possible city. Solitude, hotels, aging, love, hormones, alcohol, illness, these drifting experiences open it a little. Sometimes prolonged reading holds it ajar. Another style of consciousness inflects one's own, an odd syntactic manner, a texture of embellishment, pause, a new mode of rest. I can feel physiologically haunted by a style, 
It's why I read ideally for the structured liberation from the personal. Yet the impersonal inflection can persist outside the text beyond the passion of readerly empathy, a most satisfying transgression that arrives only inadvertently, never by force of intention. As if seized by a fateful kinship against all the odds of sociology, the reader psychically assumes the cadence of the text. She sheds herself. This description tends towards a psychological interpretation of linguistics, but the experience is also spatial. I used to drive home from my lover's apartment at 2 a.m., 3 a.m. This was Vancouver in 1995. A zone of light industrial neglect separated our two neighborhoods. Between them, the stretched out city felt abandoned. My residual excitement and relaxation would extend outwards from my body and the speeding car towards the dilapidated warehouses, the shut storefronts, the distant container yards, the dark exercise studios, the pools of sulfur light. It's a low key dereliction. I would feel pretty much free. I was a driver, not a pronoun, not a being with breasts and anguish. I was neither with the lover nor alone. I was suspended in a nonchalance. My cells were at ease. I doted on nothing. Now, after a long absence, I had returned to Vancouver as a visitor. I had delivered the lecture on wandering, tailoring, idleness, and doubt. I had conversed, feasted, slept. The following morning, alone in the hotel, I awoke to the bodily recognition that I had become the author of the complete works of Baudelaire. Even the unwritten texts, the notes and sketches contemplated and set aside, and also all of the correspondence, the fizzles and false starts and abandoned verses, the diaristic notes, I wrote them. Perhaps it is more precise to say that all at once, unbidden, I received the Baudelarian authorship or that I found it within myself. This is obviously very different from being Baudelaire, which was not the case, nor my experience. I had only written his works. It was a very quiet, neutral sensation. I associate it now with the observation of the immaterial precision of light. Such an admission will seem frivolous, overdetermined, baroque. But I will venture this. It is no more singular for me to discover that I have written the complete works of Baudelaire than it was for me to have become a poet, me, a girl, in 1984, I was as if concussed. Believe me, if you wish, I understand servitude. My task now is to fully serve this delusion. Delusion needs an architecture. This hotel room became for a crucial instant, the portal for a transmission seeking a conduit. Garments, rooms, paintings, desire. In each of these perceptual frames, there is the feeling of the movement of time as an inner experience made available to sensing and the wilderness of interpretation by way of material borders or limits. Time is my body and it is also others' bodies it could next become sentences and the reflexive pause within the phrase. This is grace, I think, the achievement in the company of strangers of the necessary precision of the pause. A sentence flourishes only as a pause in thought, which extends the invitation of an identification. The great amateurs of fashion 
understand this supple grace. Garments can translate a city, map a previously unimagined mode of freedom or consent. A garment is a pause in textile. The pause admits untimeliness. One part of time acts counter to the will. One part of our bodily life is always and only untimely. We enter the room at precisely the wrong moment. We trip against the furniture, bruising our hips. We wake in the morning unable to recognize a suitable pronoun among the conventional phonemes. The garment must dress our untimeliness. I'm looking for the nonchalance expressed in an oddly shaped collar, a collar that appears to want to lift in the breeze of an open window to caress the line of my jaw. I'm intimate with the clumsy humor of buttons, the way a new kind of fit in a tailored jacket lifts my kidneys a little, coaxing open a readerly concave chest. At night, the girls in galleries suddenly wear bright fringed shawls that move when they laugh with hair slashed straight and high across their brows. There's a new textile, it seems, something from sports or a futuristic movie. It's lightweight and silvery and the kids have plucked it off the internet to wear on the bus. It's being held to their skinny bodies by their heavy backpacks and the home tattooed arms they slide across one another's waists. There's the erotic Hello. shimmer of a silk, silk thin band t-shirt on breast skin. The emotional synchrony of garments transmits discontinuously and by energetic means, thus the metaphysical appeal of fashion. I had studied this question of fashion's intellectual spirit in some of its great theorists, Lily Reich, for example, and Ray Kawakubo, but also in my relationships to garments of every provenance. They need not have value in the commercial sense. There are the cast-offs and rejects on eBay in charity shops, draped over fences in modest residential alleys, swagging the rims of dumpsters by the apartment blocks. And certainly I have been a passionate amateur of their study and occasional acquisition. But here I'm not talking about the material research as all absorbing as it can become in its gradual, gradual irregular advancement, but the mood of a garment, the way an emotional tone is brought forward in the wearing, in the suggestive affinities of the toilette. The unfamiliar set of a shoulder or the tugging sensation of a row of tight wrist buttons can hint at the gestural vocabulary of a previous epoch and so substitute for eroded or disappeared sentimental mores. Time in the garment is what I repeatedly sought because sartorial time isn't singular, but carries the living desires of bodies otherwise disappeared. This has been part of my perverse history of garment love. I wanted to inhabit the stances, gestures and caresses of vanished passions and disciplines and the various garments each person gathers to wear together, the way she groups fibers, colors, eras, social codes, and cuts. This mysterious grammar speaks beyond the tangible and often cited economies and their various political constraints. I keep a home-sewn pale yellow silk shantung jacket that I haven't worn for decades because it once matched the hair of the girl who became my grandmother. I discovered this the season I myself was pale blonde in 1983, the year of my grandmother's death. Garments are not signs in a signifying system, not in my cosmology. Fashion is the net of the history of love. 
The hotel room was decorated with two prints of paintings, both seascapes. Around these portal-like rectangles, the walls and fabrics were all placid tints of pale green and gray. It was curious that the decorator had taken such pains to establish an aquatic theme, given that Vancouver's own harbor was visible from the window. Yet these were not port images. They showed only unpeopled, unfigured planes of sea and sky, rendered in watercolor with some expertise, bisected or linked by their horizons. This now tasteful minimalism of the previous decade left a polite space for reverie, as did the furnishings. I can't recall the carpet. It was Poe who said that the soul of an apartment is its carpet, and by this measure, I have rarely occupied a hotel room that could be said to have a soul. But I'm not sure that I want a hotel room to have a soul, since the task of that innocuous limbo is to shelter mine and unimagined others with as few contradictions as possible. I go to the hotel to evade determination. What I thought of, what I imagined in this blandly contrived place as I woke, were those marvelously glowing Baroque harbors by Claude Lorraine the ones hanging in the Louvre. Listening to the boat sounds from my bed, watching the pale light slide in from beneath the sage tinted curtain. I pictured the tall porticos rising on both sides of the sheltered water, pale columns rhyming with masts, the cheerful flapping of faded flags, the wooden hull of a great ship discharging cattle and wrapped bundles by means of little boats bare chested stevedores straining at their work while others in red and blue belted tunics and matching turbans stood stand by and discuss serious matters. A cow in a sky blue harness is being led by a man in a loincloth across a narrow gangplank to shore. I still keep an old postcard of this image now bleached of its warm tones after being propped for several years on a sunny window ledge, so that my imagination of Claude has transmuted to cool gray green blue, like the veiled marine sun of the Pacific port I now woke to. The more the Claude postcard fades, the more it resembles what I know. The two imaginary seaports by Claude these complex frontiers of an urban ambiance, as Guy Debord described them, were unrivaled in their beauty, he said, by the, were rivaled in their beauty, he said, by the Paris metro maps conveniently located at each station. The affinity of the maps and Claude's seaports had to do, he claimed, this is Debor, with his characteristically utopian vagueness with a sum of possibilities rather than any compositional aesthetics. It's a literary mode of comparison using not signs as its components, but the transformative potency of transitions, metaphors in other words. His method all, also takes into account the anticipation of transitions, not only the events themselves, which is what I like about metaphor and about De Boer. Time is perversely multiplied. Nothing replaces anything else. Contradictory sensations acquire contingent truth. The Baroque seaports of Claude Lorraine exist right now as future potentials. I would agree with De Boer about the psychogeographic equivalence of the harbor's beauty with the modern transports, but with the proviso that the similarity holds only for the time before one has ever visited Paris, when the metro in its map is still a picturesque novella by Queneau, borrowed from a small town library, or glimpsed in a scene in a film by Godard. The one, for example, where Anna Karina her childish face and pulled back hair being lightly stroked all the while by her lover. 
looks at the presumed sadness of the other Metro passengers, the moody boy with the cake box, the bored businessman read, reading the newspaper, and recites, then sings aloud a poem by Aragon. Things are what they are. From time to time, the earth trembles. The train pulls up to a station called Liberté. But is there a station called Liberty? I've never noticed it on any line I've traveled. And were the men sad? Maybe they were just angry. The tautly inflected instant of transformation between vocal recital and song, the poignant artifice of the threshold marked by a slight catch in her voice, a kind of physiological caesura or inflation that also seems spiritual is what I recall most intensely of this film, first seen on a small static strewn television screen in one of the shared sprawling apartments of the 80s. Those roughly furnished places now mythic for their three day parties and cut up poems strewn across patterned blue carpets also faded. Those carpets had soul. The pile rubbed bare to the rough jute warp in places of passage. The arabesque, as Poe called it, not only traced out in gridded botanical curlicules by the yarn of the pile, but stamped directly onto the now visible jute backing with a kind of indelible blue-black ink. True, Poe preferred crimson carpets. Transposed maps of different regions would be a variant explanation. The Vancouver hotel room I occupied that morning seemed in my state of half wakefulness to contain all the hotel rooms and temporary rooms I had ever stayed in, not in a simultaneous continuum, nor in chronological sequence, but in flickering, overlapping, and partial surges, much in the way that a dream will dissolve into a new dream yet retains some color or fragment of the previous dream, which across the pulsing transition, both remains the same and plays a new role in an altered story, like a psychic rhyme or a printed fabric whose complex pattern is built up across successive layers of impression, each autonomously perceptible, but also leading the perceiver to cognitively connect the component parts in an inner act of fictive embellishment. So strong is the desire to recognize a narrative among scattered fragments of perception. My own youth seems to move in my present life in such a way, present and absent, at times incoherent, sometimes frightening, scarcely recognizable, rhyming, and drifting. Um, I think I'll call it short there. I think I've been reading for 20 minutes from this book, which is what we agreed upon in our organizational uh, volley of emails. Thank you very much, uh, Lisa. I was following actually the pages. Uh, so um, uh, it was really amazing that when I prepared for my with my own questions I was focusing on the same uh, extracts you uh, <laughs> unknowingly were choosing as well so so uh, uh, I, I could uh, uh, listen to you reading uh, for hours and hours but as you say we do need to stop here so that we can move on with the uh, with the uh, with the schedule uh, I'm just going to kick off with my hopefully not too uh, obscure uh, and uh, elongated essay, like uh, more like ideas or series of ideas thrown thrown at you rather than a, a, a concrete question, which is uh, I'm very grateful that you were reading uh, the sections regarding uh, uh, the theme re garment and fabric and and material and uh, fiber and um, um, 
uh, sort of living organic uh, stuff uh, that that uh, uh, your writing is is really made of. I, I feel uh, so. You start your novel with this sentence: "Reading unfolds like a game called I." Uh, right in the opening pages of, of, of the book, wearing already on the first pages, she declares your protagonist odd garments. Uh, the narrator Hazel Brown, who also describes herself as feminine, as Rousseau, dressed in various pronouns, gender crossovers. Uh, we, sometimes I imagine her, the poet in the poet, the girl in the girl. Um, who also declares that she has become as 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 you you were reading not so much more Baudelaire but the, the but the work that Baudelaire wrote, and then later on in the following pages she also continues to say or claim that uh, reflecting on wearing pronouns uh, or struggling towards pronouns, so so I somehow feel that. And late, also later on in the same chapter, uh, this so-called pronoun that, that you often refer to and this playfulness with, with uh, uh, pronouns as, as role, historical, political, uh, social gender role, or even the writer's role, uh, becomes a kind of spatial temporal skin um, some sort of garment that covers the body. Uh, so I kind of like, and later on, uh, the whole kind of theme regarding coats, garments, carpets, fabrics, I, I feel becomes a, a really important transformation trope uh, throughout the whole novel. Later on, uh, sort of, uh, there is a semi, I don't know, humorous scene whereby your narrator uh, obsessed with, with the various jackets and obsessing around this final jacket. The, the jacket keeps going, the jacket coat garment keeps kind of morphing, metamorphing from one thing to the next, from one concrete or met, uh, jacket to a metaphorical um, overcoat, which also reminded me of the Dostoevsky line, we all have come out of Gogol's overcoat. Um, but either way, uh, towards the end of the novel, it becomes, a, a really beautiful scene where it becomes uh, a really a, a really disturbing but also humorous scene when when the, one of the jackets you're writing about it becomes uh, um, so worn out but it also of almost semi alive because it's full of like hundreds and hundreds of moths which are eating away the the fabric but also make at the same time also simultaneously creating this living uh, and very organic material uh, from something that is um, uh, not alive, which kind of also reminded me of the Marlo Ponte common flesh uh, idea. So I was just wondering after my rather long, more like reflection rather than concrete, question if you could talk a little bit about this folding unfolding metaphor mm. um what can i say about it it's 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 not uh it's not something i mapped out before i began to write in any sort of um uh, predetermined way it's more like uh the garment as an image becomes a way for me to describe something I want to get at, but am not able to in any more in, in a direct way, which is the very uncertain and shifting experience of identification and self-identity and the way that it on the one hand remains a kind of ribbon-like continuity through one's life insofar as one recognizes oneself as being the same person 
at the same time that it's 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 radically transformed in through the simplest events such as reading a book and passionately identifying with um, with the um, speaker or narrator or first person or character in the book you're reading or the experience perhaps of making love and how transformational that can be that you know you can leave a room and be a different person um so this this to me very um um, mysterious but but vital um, shifting matrix of uncertainty, which feels like the main continuity to me in my own living experience. It, 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 in order to talk about it, you, you need you need images. You need you need to clothe it in something, and um, like. Um, some, some people brought up as girls to become women. Um, I've been very interested in fashion um, and its, its power and its disappointing traits and its, um, its, its way of um, coding um, um, social experience. Uh -huh. since, since I was really young, since before adolescence, you know, it's something that I received as a kind of matrilineal heritage. My grandmother showing me very old garments and explaining their construction and describing the fi difference between different fibers and different weaves and so on and so forth. So I think that for me, um, textile and garments have been a language that I've been more intimate with than the language of literature. Mm -hmm. they, they go back very far into my family life, whereas uh, literature doesn't, as far as I'm aware in my family. I think I'm the only one ever. <laughs> so, uh, so it's, I feel uh, an ease in, in returning to um, descriptions and analyses and interpretations of, of fiber. And, and, and I, I also feel that it's something that um, um, the necessity of dressing is something that every single person has in common. What, mm -hmm. you know, although we have obviously very, very different attitudes towards it that are conditioned by um, class and labor situations and um, colonial situations, et cetera. Um, nevertheless, we, we all put on clothes in the morning. So it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a fundamental gestural vocabulary as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Amazing. Um, thank you. Um, I will just uh, uh, pass the next question on to to Adam. Uh, yeah, thank, thanks, Aggie. Uh, uh, thank you, Lisa, for a great reading. I, I was just, uh, a part of the reading was uh, very beautifully thinking about the pause. Um, and um, you talked also about the caesura. I mean, H Hazel Brown states one point, the caesura inserted its livid pause in my thinking of words. Here, I'll call it writing. Uh, and, you, and you said in your uh, 2010 interview that you talked about the immaterial work of the caesura is to subvert the fixing of language by protocols and institutions to renew a historicity within the subject. I, I was wondering if you could say a little bit how you define that historicity of the subject and how uh, writing in ways that foregrounds the, the livid pause can help um, the subject uh, evade determination or evade the fixing of language. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, a lot of these statements are that I make about um, pronoun language, rhythm in and prosody in language, um, the caesura, are really informed um, 
by my readings and my interpretation of um, a couple of different French linguists, uh, Henri Méchanique, who has written at length on uh, sort of geopolitics of rhythm and language, and um, Emile Benveniste, the elder of the two, who um, Méchanique learned a great deal from, and who also wrote about uh, rhythm. And what closely reading their work and doing a certain amount of translation of their work, basically in order to try to understand it better, um, slowly came to show me was that um, the cadences of our speaking and of our writing the ways we pause, group, slow down, speed up, um, um, the way our, our vocal texture, our punctuation changes and shifts in, in a line is um, a major aspect of um, the meaningfulness of our language. So that's to say that um, in, this, in this linguistic, um, discourse, that language can't be reduced to a binary sign where um, a word perhaps acts as a sign that has a, has a, a, a direct correspondence to um, between a, a sound and a concept. So this, this theory of rhythm in language is um, blurring and complicating and critiquing the the, 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 the binary um, um, nature of linguistic discourse. And what that, what that seems to do when, for me, when I start to think about that is to um, open a space for the in indetermination of experience, the, the, the blurry things, when we continue to speak as I am right now, for example, without exactly knowing what I'm gonna say next, because <laughs> I hadn't written it out, I didn't know what you were gonna ask me. So I'm just speaking and trying to address it. And it's possible that more than these words and, and and sort of direct references I'm coming up with, speaking the name Benveniste, speaking the word, the, the, the name Machinique, saying a phrase such as the binary sign. Perhaps that's less important than the texture of, um, of pause, of hesitation, of little bursts forward that are um, in, inherent to, um, to this, this speaking, to this response. Um, and that's what interests me in writing as a process as well, that I don't begin knowing what I'm going to say, but let um, a, an improvised stylistics of rhythm, of um, sentence formation, um, of sentence destruction in some cases, let it bring me into an unsuspected meaning. And that just feels more precise to my own experience. So. Yeah. Amazing, thanks. Adam, do you think uh, we should move on to the second part of the reading or? Yeah, we, we, we do have um, some questions that maybe we can put to the end of the reading. Um, well, why don't we include one, one of those questions right now, just so okay. that somebody else is included and then, and then I can um, go on. From the uh, I'll let you deal with who okay. and what. Okay. Um, the, the, sorry, do you want to read it? No, you do it, please. Okay, uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, Mark, Mark Lindsay is asking, uh, says your work is clearly informed by a huge amount of research. And it must be bewildering to handle that amount of material while wrangling it into a poem. Do you have a method for organizing and manipulating your research material, or is it something that differs uh, in every project? Well, it does differ in every project. I mean, my books are really different 
um, but from one another, generally speaking. But at the same time, you know, I do write a lot of commissioned essays and like a lot of people in who are attending this reading, I sometimes teach. So there's a certain amount of preparation that goes on um, ahead of time for those activities, writing a commissioned essay or teaching. At the same time, the division of, um, of, of this sort of process of moving into language into discrete categories of like research and composition um, doesn't feel precise to my experience of how things work. Basically, I'm a note taker. You know, I take notes in notebooks. I know when I'm taking the notes, it's kind of mysterious. It's probably why I continue doing it. I don't know how I'm going to use them. And who knows when we're in the process of reading or we've stopped reading and are just thinking about what we're reading. What makes, uh, what's the little impulse that makes us pick up our pen to write something down? Whether that's a direct citation from a book or, um, or whether it's uh, an, an interruption, some criticism or comment we have about what we're reading. So I'm really fascinated about what goes into notebooks and how they just seem continuously sort of refreshing to me. And in a way, I'm much more interested in, in those notebook pages than I am in published work mm -hmm. uh, because they're not seeking to be something. You know, they're just a, a record of movements of mind and, and movements of interest, you know, all this stuff you get interested in over the years for reasons, you know, things friends tell you about, things you need to learn about for certain, you know, public appearances or, or, or events. So uh, what I do is I, I return to those notebooks um, hopefully having kind of forgotten what I wrote in them or what or why. And I just try to approach those notes as new material, totally fresh, and just try to find ways to craft things from them. And that, that um, crafting or composing, I guess, can happen in many ways. You know, sometimes I'm very indexical and I will just alphabetize a list of phrases because I seem interested in what the reorganization of alphabetization does. Other times I take very disparate, disparate phrases from very different projects and try to kind of build a sentence which might indicate some thought that seems new to me. One of the things I'm interested in about writing or one of the main things is that you can actually make new thoughts in a sentence. Um, so rather than having what you're writing down represent a, some, some, some sort of so-called complete idea that you've already had, the, 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 the writing is more like instructing your mind about forms of possibility, showing or it's playing um, with the possible. So when I'm using all these notes that I take for God knows what reason, um, I'm trying to move more into a zone of the mysterious possible than a kind of recitation of an expertise. Thank you. We don't have any questions from the... Uh audience at the moment so um i would like to squeeze in a very cheeky one before we move on which mm -hmm. is which is uh, somewhere on page 32 in in baudelaire fractal your narrator announces that that the poem and i'm asking this because we've got lots of poet students here today from sheffield so just to provoke you a little bit, what did what does you what does Hazel Brown or your narrator mean, or this spectral character who often I think is a, a real um, um, fusion of uh, more than one uh, person or personality uh, mean by? It's actually a really beautiful passage, by the way. But the first line goes as such. Uh, she's contemplating in an, yet another hotel room of all stupid art. The poem is mm -hmm. the most stupid. 
Oh, that's a direct um, um, citation of Baudelaire. Okay. Yeah, and um, fold, folded in all throughout this novel, folded in are um, fragments of bits of my own translation from, um, I mean, I was reading Baudelaire really both intensely and widely. Mm -hmm. So I read most of his correspondence, for example, and um, you know, his notes and his, his art, obviously his art criticism, as well as um, his prose poems and his poems. And um, yeah, that, that's, um, Baudelaire says, art must be stupid. And I, you know, I identify with that, you know, maybe what I, I would sort of use this term of the possible rather than the stupid, but it's very similar in saying that, you know, I agree with Baudelaire in saying that we don't, we don't make art in order to express our supposed intelligence. <laughs> We don't write a poem to show how, you know, how smart we are and how we've understood something. We write it because we don't know what the hell is going on. <laughs> we write it from a point of stupidity. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that anything is only interesting insofar as it, um, it, it begins from this point of stupidity and tries to remain in it and, and resists the, um, the often irresistible um, um, nature of, of, of cleverness. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. But so yeah, I mean, that was Baudelaire. Uh, in, in, except that then, that then then you develop the sentence into a, a, a beautiful philosophical reflection on li liquid sort of fluid and water and swimming and and pool and uh, you take it into a completely different uh, direction. But anyway, uh, thank you. Shall we move on to the next second uh, yeah. half? Yeah. Uh, Lisa um, is going to read from new work. Um. It's, it's interesting to read this after um, thinking about the question about how I use research and describing my um, notebook um, writing, which I assume is pretty typical to most of us who write, even though lots of people are writing on their telephones now, which I do a little bit of that note taking thing on the phone, but I still really like the materiality of the bound paper notebook. Um, and I like its durability too, because certainly I'm not going to be keeping phones for 20 or 30 years, um, but I do keep notebooks for that long. And this um, new work I'm, I'm um, just feeling my way into now is intended to be a new section for the, um, the series of po long poems that was published as first Rousseau's boat and then ours boat um back in um um the early 2000s and 2010 and um this project i conceived as being a kind of procedural archival autobiography where i systematically went back through decades of old notebooks culling out material to make new compositions with and um um there's going to be a new publication um, that this time will just be called Boat in the interest of continuously shortening um, um, the title of the project. Um, and so, and Coach House will publish it. We don't have a date yet because I'm, as usual, um, floating around in total uncertainty about what I'm doing. Um, but this work is um, towards a new sort of long layer, let's call it, of the Russo's Boat Project and is working from notebooks that I've kept since, um, I guess from since 2003, which are the ones I have at home with me currently and are not in an archive. I made the really big mistake of um, depositing my earlier notebooks in an archive when they asked me, um, partly because honestly, I was flattered, which is really a, you know, real personality error. 
and partly because it seemed practical because I was about to be I was about to move from Vancouver to France so it seemed like a good idea to let go of junk and um, just to put it somewhere else. So there were those two things operating together, um, vanity and practicality. So anyways, now I only have my notebooks going back to 2003. So this uh, is formed from them. Um, and I keep changing my idea of what it might be called for, it, it began as, the idea of writing a, um, a bestiary. Um, but then it started morphing and my selections became less and less programmatic than they had been in previous installments in this Ars Boat project where I'd been quite sort of conceptually tight about the way I was um, um, working with this notebook material indexically. So um, this is a much uh, looser take on the material, and I've been I've been working on it um, since um, since the winter, the early New Year, maybe February, and I just started typing it all up um, last week. So I am certain that this is going to go through a lot of changes, and I decided to read it just because I've really been reading the Baudelaire fractal quite often. And it seemed like maybe for me personally, a slightly more interesting risk to take to read unfinished work and process, but um, it might be a less interesting um, experience for you as <laughs> listeners, so we'll see. The idea of the unassignable is where I'll begin this morning. It's a late beginning. Solitude is not the opposite of so sociality or the communal. It is sociality slowed down to its most inefficient manifestation. Solitude is a technique of slowness. To me, spiritual experience in airplanes is part of a history of retreat. In the plane tonight, Everything becomes allegory. We watched night fall on the subject like a cocktail. And I thought I would like to lie down in the dry leaves and fuck. And you rhyme hip hop with Pope in micro units of end stopped sound. Then the focus pulls back to the city and I'm watching all the full moons of Facebook rising in digital increments. Subjectivity is temporality, I read in my notes. I wake up to the bellowing of a cow through low fog. By rejecting the poets, he is expelling metaphor from knowledge. Metaphor can't be legislated. Benveniste's poetics of linguistics is a reopening to metaphor to the mobility of the image. Time is difficult in the vocal revolving night. The animal doesn't have a soul. The animal is a soul. When I touch something, I'm touching the culture of human figure, fingers, which I believe in strongly. I have a double feeling. They are not wearing time, they are touching it. When we wake into form, we experiment with belief. Day opens, an ovoid vase, an ovoid vase with twisted ribbing, an ovoid vase, green, green, clear, a slab, a shape, a cylinder, a massy plaster cloud, sun slips upwards. Did a sentence change your life? I added my own straw to contribute to the conflagration. The one body-wide muscle spoke. The colors of voices are adorable. And in my chest, I cross the room to walk towards a voice. There she is, pacing in her revolutionary great coat and midi culottes. She asks, what about solitude as an art? Solitude 
course, heavy and blistered, where all the elements are invoked with innumerable gradations. It is unimportant whether the reactions are strong or weak in spite of her introspection, which can be traced to the periphery. It was a famously cold winter. The two absences before and after, they felt true to protect the character of the girl's desire as the figure of a blazing. I'm deep in the obliterated region, dripping brightness. How much life is stored in a vowel? Older than names, it lies and expires. Successively, the words will be taken away but the vowels will not be taken away. The smell of stale urine at the heart of the rose is vowel of the communal substrata. It is 2003, the beginning of the exploration of the female pronoun. A fire has been burning. I wait. The Baroque wall clock with the base of hortensias has stopped at eight minutes to 10. A fax arrives from Jacques. It is a boulet or lodge in the room scented with roses. The story of the mauve fortuny gown, does it exist? Money is a nervous sinew, a labyrinth, a delirium. Painting is a hot, sweet, temperate, red humor, paired in the veins and the liver. Its office is to give strength, to put belief and dissonance together on a surface, like a layer of luxurious silt that sinks. Time in prose becomes fearless. What I want to address here is inertia, sloth, and drag. What can a sentence do besides give more time to ideas. The words become the room of experience. Always, I reject the present. Some were knowing and some were thinking. They were undertaking their research in places hidden or unhidden, anywhere beside rivers, beneath trees, in renovated basements while browsing in chaotic junk shops, in attic libraries of ship-like houses, on long flights on airplanes while sipping cheap cognac, while riding their bicycles to markets in gymnasia, gazing into the fog extremely early in the morning while the radio flickered, sorting cutlery. Some of their organs were outside history. This also meant to think. The next idea, could pictures be heaven? I go to the museum to test the hypothesis. I'd like it to be lurid and light, falling and rising like an act or the inestimable spaciousness of trees. Now I'm freely dreaming into the sound of my heartbeat. If poetry is to exist, it must say something about calamity, disintegration, whatever human ethics are, with ferocious humility. This could be my beginning, the desire to speak with the dog from all the black moods of the organs near the public lilacs of the station lawn. Each night, the poem becomes a bus. This would be aesthetical, I think, since I'm part of the history of the ignorance of Latin. I would like to be permitted some whimsy as well. A kind of sap is flowing through the entire house, lung-like and pronominal. What if I did assume gods exist? How would I contemplate them? Someone opens a window I didn't know was there. Mainly there was shame and its portable territory. A day passes like a breath. What will teach me how to live? Tell me, 
suave, diddling, rapacious Cupid, you who follow beginning's chord to your feral parts from which slips a milky resin, feeding the world, ripping blandness from the chest, the plowed up districts palpitate. And I wept for death in general. And my body was the image that wept. I dress this body near the stillness of closed wardrobes. I remember the ground, everything that was growing from it. Yellow wild snapdragon, Queen Anne's lace, milkweed, daisy, cornflower, dandelion, timothy, burdock. I lay down in it with my own nerves and blood. I heard the ringing of my own nerves and blood. I was a falling star longing for the visible. Hair in 1995, Moby Dick, Bella Tarr. I was the flexible medium of the future and the impossibility of beginning. And I was arching back to possess the night sky. I was among rocks longing for the visible. Style is conflict. Recur, citing Benveniste. The sentence pours language back into the universe. I think this is so. And if the sentence pours, it pours in a direction. Who pours the sentence? The friend pours it. There's the pouring sense. The sentence has the cup or vessel or mouth, the mouth feel of the sentence as it pours near the long size of the old radiator, the breath of the house. We will protest, we will distinguish, we will laugh. There will sometimes be long silences at tables. We will wonder about Zoroastrianism. I will wake up in the middle of the night to tell you that I want to be fearless. For you, I want to be fearless is the sentence. We're full of secrets. At 1 a.m., the sound of a snow shovel's muffled scraping. Who shovels their walkway at 1 a.m.? Then once again, I discover the female annulled in some rare text I was about to idolize. The feminine again needs me or I need her anger so as not to disappear again. Dear buggered up world, I wake up sipping light. Time holds the tree and I together. Fog has held sound against the earth and muffled it. I burn like a candle with the good luck to be born. Something bleats. It makes me want to wear my feathered hip skirt. Bachelors, everything I know about language I learned from sex. I'm really fucked up with fear. You were really fucked up with fear. So you stroked your own body and you have the throat of a flower and you listen with your eyes. An image rises in the thymus like a beautiful smoke. smoke. My pelvis and the street spoke. As for the ordinary femininity of the absolutely splendid elsewhere, the elsewhere of my grandmother in my speech, I admire the odd transitions from frantic to stately. I am trying to become the laziest muscle or the little bone in the foot that Goethe discovered by comparative deduction. When my tongue sips her name, it goes, it carries, it breaches, it sutures, smoothly the signaling sky, smoothly the boats on water. Her forearm with the awkwardness at inner crook of elbow, where lives all the lost expressiveness in the history of adolescence, plus the extraordinary mobility of horses viewed from a train. It's still true that I want to decorate mortality. Let's start. 
deep in the seductive landscape, I am leaning on the railing as a way of not being otherwise. Big dropped rain now knocking the yellow leaves from the field maple. The intense things in my mind, I'm afraid of them. Duration is the material. It resists us. There is the struggle between duration and the idea. The rest is just pebbles. I wait. Where painting ends, and medicine begins is a page where a nearly total intimacy can ensue. Karen cries on the bus. There is an organ-like proximity of documents. An animal is a unit of attention. A truck passes, a dog barks, and then the frogs start. There is still the occasional nightingale next to the elections. Style is huge. I was living in this hut on the edge of fields as a form of direct action. No one really noticed. Thinking in life is a refusal of the quotidian as such. Here, I am thinking of time as negativity, extinction, abolishment, loss, but it is not amusing. The spleen's function, says Plato, is to keep the liver shiny and sparkling. Then it can receive images as clearly as possible. Upstairs, the husky scent of summer. All afternoon, sultry thunder in the distance. The dog's dis dismay. My right side ovary spoke. Perhaps Venus is the work of the image and thought. Today, Sunday, 10.21 a.m., I am going for a feeling. The question of the origin of geometry will be that feeling. I am very uncomfortable and very stimulated. As I write this, I sweat. Geometry brings the Caesura into my mouth. It is a portable gift. I can't say my Caesura as I can't say my horizon, but they give me a stance. Venus is a transcender. How did that happen? She stays on the surface. With the flight path of a hornet, I write. And then the voice said, must we oppose emotion to philosophy and so on? because subjectivity is the transformation of the social and contexts an expansion of synchrony beyond the object proper. All the novels I won't write are passing through my hands like water from prolix prolixity to parsimony, the great sadness of incompleteness, this, the disrupted ordinary. These were the three things I wanted to write. I spoke from memory, a speaking name. Everything with the character of privacy witnesses the branches of grammar moving, the perplexing vernacular of wasting time. There's no mystery to what women do in history. We think by the fire. Day after day, I fail at what I have to do. Alas, I forgot. It's because the heart's torn out of my chest. I go back to the idea of a sonically installed irony. You will be my correspondent. I look up and the sky is a vast pink palace. Now abalone, now old indigo refracting silence. There could be anger in the descriptive project, such as the feeling of being erotically assessed by the powerful aging man who has become pot-bellied. Apart from all that, I would like some delicate, robust sonic shapes, calm and alert and lusty. It's by way of metaphor that the image enters the body cellularly. When 
I first noticed the dust on the leaves, I, adjectival, rinky-dinky, winsome, thought, must I ache? To lie on a bed and scratch, to feel my clothing against my skin, to jub gently rub my bare feet together, to rest my cheekbone on my opened upwards palm. There is no convincing etymology for it. Jane Ellison says, all sensation is movement. We want to know how to let time be heard in our work. Ordinary ferocities are nice. The dry tree of the room is what the sun climbs. My desire to admire Humboldt, Bop, Saussure was 2010. In terms of medicine or grammar, memory transmits the smell of the white page and the vertical dimension of the green violet. I want to look at you and ask you questions. I Google continuous movement and find Thomas of Aquinas speaking of time and angels in the Summa Theologica. The soul is Kleinemann. I should relax more. Sociality isn't number. Could philosophy be a collage? Simone Weil says no. Now the relaxing equivalence of bodies. I think a lot about death, why you died when you did, what came before, the frustrated love, days of exhilaration, defeat. Whole peoples die, the spirit leaves, an emergency plants itself, calling my name and your voice. The perfume bottle, two thirds full, sits on the edge of the bedroom table, refracting sun. Now for the patience of painting. Now to construct Poussin indexically in order to abolish the distinction between art and politics. Firstly, the methodological privacy of an idea. I can only misunderstand death, but I feel it sends me images standing entirely aloof there could be secrets I dedicate myself to without knowing. What if my great long love is this foliage? I need to learn its materials. The poem unwinds in excruciatingly synthetic slow motion before it acquires the real time of reading, whatever that variable may represent. In my experience, it is not through identification, but refusal that the work is made. It must shed all elegance against the vague hum of the heating apparatus. Fleas move from body to body in the night. How is it that this perfectly predictable action suggests that mind and matter are not separate systems? All matter is about to undo itself by slowing down the causal interval without subjecting it to subsequent recomposition. Here voice is not instrument, but topology, retaining all the snags and silliness in the idea of the indexical. I'll stop this reading there. Here. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much, Lisa. I was thinking all the way through, well, if this is at the work in progress state, then I look forward to the actual Polish, Polish work. Absolutely beautiful uh, stuff. Thank you. Um, so whilst you were reading, we've had a couple of questions coming in, and I mm -hmm. also know that Adam's got uh, one or two to finish uh, the evening with. So since I've uh, added my extra cheeky question in the first half, I'm just gonna uh, give you the opportunity, Adam, to. Uh, yeah, yeah. M maybe we could start with um, uh, the question, that, uh, one of the questions um, from Fiona uh, Bowie. 
uh, who writes, I, I was thinking of your articulation of a pause extends an invita invitation of identification in terms of the possibility of also inserting one's imagination while entertaining forms of possibility. And it's inoculative um, potential vis-a-vis -vis the common velocity of contemporary media, the way information is typically di disseminated in ever increasingly tight time fragments, edit points that work against the insertion of self, giving more time to ideas, quote, being the key here, so that the forms you create, Lisa, with their pauses, challenge the ubiquitous lust for speed and its globally destructive thoughtlessness. <clears throat> well, that seems like a um, extremely uh, flattering version of a description or an interpretation, Fiona. Um, and I feel um, um, lucky to be heard <laughs> in the way that um, you've, you've been hearing what I've written and read. Um, I do, though, want to say that um, I don't want to place a writing and a thinking and a making practice in utter opposition to um, um, social media and various um, forms of media that we participate in to different degrees for different people and different times in our lives. Um, what I object to with these media is, um, is how they can be used as uh, forms of social control and censorship and how they're um, owned <laughs> and how um, our participation in them gets transformed into profit. That's, you know, it's, it's, that's not an atypical stance by any means. At the same time, our, our pleasure in, in using them and participating in them points to, um, points to um, well, it points to pleasure, it points to need. I mean, we, we want to, um, we want to hang out <laughs> and um, we're not always able to, you know? I mean, obviously there's the current um, so-called pandemic, which has ruined that for everybody, the possibility of hanging out. But even apart from this, uh, this, this, this huge messed up moment we're living in, you know, people move, people, we're, we're far away from people. So, I have, a, I have a forked feeling about media. Um, and I mean, I'm really aware that um, the printed book is, a, is, 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 you know, a precursor to the, the current forms of media that, um, that we're also critiquing and perhaps being um, administered by. Um, the printed book is a product of, of the rise of capital and the Renaissance. And, you know, um, I don't want to reject books. Um, I think that the, the important thing is to um, histor historicize and be able to articulate critiques of the media we're participating in and also to uh, abuse them as much as possible to, um, you know, um, enter these, enter these, um, these, um, forms um, in order to maximize a kind of uh, radical sociality, um, a sharing, a rejection, uh, a, a screwing up of the surface of all of it. Okay. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, we do have a quick follow-up question uh, from Sarah Edwards about Google, Google internet searches uh, mm -hmm. in your reading and um, uh, Sarah says she's interested in how you feel the experience of being online and using Google fits alongside or hangs in tension with 
your interests in rhythm and on the back of that how does the, oh, that's interesting how does the internet fit into your writing process if it if at all yeah well it does i mean i google things constantly i mean i remember having to sort of save up my questions and drive to the university library on the other side of the city you know once every two weeks or something and and, and try to you know address those questions you know before before we all had laptops and before the internet before Google was a thing, you know. So I mean, it's it's remarkably convenient, and um, I I used it a lot when I was writing um, the Baudelaire Fractal, my novel, because um, you know you want to get references right, or suddenly it's it's great for bringing up images. You know, suddenly I want to look at Claude, or you know I want to find out something about Christo's wrapping of the Pont Neuf. You know. What was that textile? So um, I, I, I use it as a kind of uh, junk food um, that, um, you know, we all kind of use it like that. Um, at the same time, I, I really like this question about rhythm that you insert in the use, in, in, the, in the, you know, in, into the habit, the Google habit. Um, and I'd have to, you know, think about that more and sort of observe my my um, my Googling more um, before I could really answer it. But I think that's an interesting thing for anybody present to try to do to, you know, imagine our our participation in these um, platforms in terms of uh, social rhythm. Um, and. It's fairly new for me to include mentions of these things in my texts as I write them, mentions of Facebook, mentions of Googling, but it suddenly occurred to me that it's just really daft not to, to, you know, pretend that, you know, I'm some sort of, you know, Renaissance prince or something off spilling ink somewhere <laughs> instead of just, you know, being the, being the abuser of social media that I in inevitably am. And uh, why should that, that's part of the texture of subjectivity um, in my life. So uh, why not include it with everything else? So I'm, I'm trying to do that without over-determining that either, just in a kind of loose, easy way, just, as, just to see what happens with that. Although I, I resent, I, it's, it is kind of awful though, like dropping brand names, like, you know, seeing a big Coca-Cola can in the movie or something. I mean, Google's a brand name. So there's that aspect to it that, you know, I don't want to be make, writing a commercial for <laughs> these people. <laughs> Anyways. Yeah, um, I, I've just got a, a, a question about um, time, uh, just to, to do with the, the um, sections you're reading from, and, the, and just the weird uh, temporality of, of voice and body um, once they become uh, words on the page. I was wondering uh, how, how you touch time um, with nerves and blood and um, and 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 your, your your meditation on organs in particular, to particularly sort of odd and neglected organs like uh, the crook of the elbow or the or the spleen. And I'm just wondering what how 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 are the, those things are sort of coming together. Well, I guess it won't be surprising for you to hear me say I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm really just kind of going for this intuitively and um, there's, there's scads of all different kinds of um, quotation and citation and reflection in all of these notebooks. And this seems to be what I'm compelled towards now. Um, in part, I, I continue to feel an urgency about trying to say something about the timeliness of embodiment Partially, this has to do with my own curiosity about the aging process and, you know, its ubiquitous inevitability, which is, you know, anybody who's lucky enough to not die gets to experience. And it partly comes from experiencing the, you know, deaths of friends and, you know, just this, it's very hackneyed to say, 
obviously it all goes by very quickly. So how, how do we, you know, capture the texture of that movement? And um, I don't really know is the answer, but a number of these notebooks were being um, thrown together, um, stretched out during a time when um, a good friend and I were experiencing grave illness and then during her death. So, um, and then also accompanying other friends through uh, horrible losses and deaths in their um, personal lives. So I'm interested in finding a way to talk about this kind of experience without monumentalizing it. Um, and, you know, frankly, a lot of my time gets put into researching how to take care of my body properly, you know, you can see the supplements I currently take and the, the um, real estate on the kitchen counter. You know? <laughs> There's always something new to take for something. So it's like, you're, it's, it's very, very interesting to learn about these, these um, various descriptions of, of um, organ life and how we might, um, how we might intervene and, and help it. And um, um, so it's just something I want to include too, alongside maybe wasn't there wasn't so much in the sections I read, but there's a lot of just descriptions of what notebooks feel like and their, you know, crumbling uh, materiality and bindings falling off of things and spills on paper and all of that sort of material decrepitude, which um, um, our bodies share with the um, supposedly inanimate universe. I, I like to track that. Yeah. Great. Th thanks a lot. So the, over you, Taggy. I think I think we've come to the end of the questions now, uh, and I, I think there is uh, no other uh, coming from the floor either. So, um, uh, yeah, a huge thank you, uh, uh, Lisa, for sharing the new work as well as as uh, reading from uh, the Baudelaire fractal. Uh, I think I think we 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 were very lucky today to to have you and and hear hear especially the new work um, in the making and hopefully uh, hopefully we can see you soon uh, sometime in in yeah. in, uh, in real life <laughs> I don't know when I, that is I'm getting my next vac my second vaccination tomorrow so. <laughs> Oh, no. As soon as it's possible to not quarantine, um, I'm going somewhere, man. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what the situation is uh, in France like at the moment, but uh... it's it's loosening up quite a lot, um, and um, my partner and I are beginning to travel quite a lot in France. And museums are open. I've been to the Louvre once, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. which felt extremely moving after not really being there for about two years. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there are restaurant dinners that occur with groups of unmasked people. It, it all feels like a surreal it <laughs> is. event, yeah. but um, I'm all for it. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. And uh, good to see that you are doing really well as well. So uh, just on the final note, uh, uh, um, thank you to you all coming. Um, I've, I've had a quick look at all the familiar names. It was all lovely to, to have you tonight. And regarding next year uh, and the program for, for next academic, academic year within the center, we'll soon be in touch sometimes early September. Um, we're, quite, we're not quite sure yet how we're going to continue running the series, depending on, of course, uh, on, the, on the COVID. Uh, but it will probably be a mixture of online events with a, with a few real events, so to say, uh, already introduced. Or perhaps we were thinking of somebody's given me this idea of doing a kind of hybrid whereby we have a very small number of people mm -hmm. in a physical space, but we kind of still run it 
as a as a Zoom event, which I think would be really good if somebody can help us with the technology and help to set that up. But we we'll sort it out very very soon, and the and the program as well for the new year. So huge thank you, Lisa, uh, and thank you, Adam, for co co running the evening. And uh, I don't know. I'm just going to stop the recording now. Okay. Which means that people who want to continue. Yeah, too bad we just can't have um, 